Welcome back to our channel, Warriors. We are still growing. Today, we have a banger interview with a special guest, somebody that did a lot of time behind California state prison walls, man. 29 years total. Total, our new guest is, his name is Brian. Brian, what's up, man? Why don't you tell us uh, a little about yourself, an introductory, and let's just shoot from there, man. Yeah, what's up, Lieutenant? I appreciate you having me on. So, um, you know, in terms of our conversation and what we're going to talk about, my qualifications are just that. I did 29 years in prison. I'm a former juvenile lifer. Um, you know, I, I grew up um, in a house full of addiction, both drugs, gang activity. Um, I migrated to the streets early, looking for that love and acceptance like most people. I found it, um, and I did anything I could to maintain it, up to and including my charge of murder, which I was convicted for, second-degree murder. I was given 20 years to life, and this is after, you know, multiple arrests. I have been to camp, to YA. I went, you know, through the whole juvenile system. I probably touched every aspect of, of the California system from juvenile to adult. Um, 20 to life sentence, I opened up Salinas Valley at 18 years old. Um, you know, the same issues that plagued my life continued in prison. Um, I, became, I became worse. Uh, I became indoctrinated. I became taught by, by older gentlemen, and I, I was a willing participant. And, um, you know, ultimately, I stayed in that ugly cycle for years, getting validated as a prison gang associate, spending you know, a decade in the shoe, until I hit the point, like most people were, I lost the love of my life, which was my grandmother. Damn. And at that moment, when you're shattered, you, you sit back and you look at yourself like, what do I have to show for myself? I, have, I had nothing. I had a body, full of, a body full of tattoos, scars, a bunch of war stories that um, I was ashamed of almost at that point. So I turned my life around. Um, I began trying to think different. Uh, I changed the books I read. You know, I tried to re-indoctrinate myself, rewire myself, untangle this crazy web that mm. I'm low-key trying to still untangle today. That's how deep these things run. But I changed my life. I took part in a, uh, the peaceful hunger strike. I was released from the shoe. Um, I signed up for the Positive Change Dog Program, revolutionized my life. The two dogs I trained, my mother adopted. I came home to them four years later. Wow. Yeah. Uh, got a good behavior override, went to Ironwood State Prison, which is uh, the actual yard that's been a lot in the news lately. Took full advantage of that um, college self-help programming. Went to board for my second time. I was in there for an hour. The commissioner came back and said that was the easiest decision I've ever made in my life. I've been home, working hard, doing the best I can ever since. It's hard. It's a struggle. Like, life is punching at me from all angles. But, hey. Hey, dude, like, hey, man, I'm stoked about your progress, your growth, dude. Like, man, that was a, an awesome synopsis of, like, everything that we went through, man. And I know that is not easy. Trust me, I know that is not easy. Let's take it back to, you said, the youth growing up in a, um addiction household. How much, well, how old were you around that time frame? And how much of an influence do you think that had in your personal development? Yeah, well, that was huge. So I was born um, addicted in vitro, which means my mother used, um, you know, during the pregnancy. So I actually came into this world kicking and screaming through a withdrawal. Um, you know, growing up in a, in a house of addiction, you know, uh, they forget to feed you. They forget you're there. You get ignored, you know, and you start to internalize these things. And in my mind, I took it personal. I'm thinking, wow, if my own mother and father don't want me, there's really got to be something serious about me. I'm not conscious of, of addiction at this point. So with that love, that uh, acceptance, that belonging that I'm dying for growing up in my life, I used to see it on TV. I used to see colors. I used to hear NWA, and, 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 and it was shit was almost like commercials to me. I said, wow, I would hear these words like family and for life, and these are the things I'm dying for. So I hit the streets, and I went looking for exactly that. And you found it. And I found it. Man, I'm, I'm not going to lie, dude. It's... It, it... It's heartbreaking. It broke my heart when I heard you say, you know, you came into this world like that because I do have family members that have brought in children into this world under those same circumstances, man. And damn, dude, to me and to the rest of the world, we, with the way we think is like they didn't even get a, sh a chance. You know what I mean? They didn't even get a fair shake, like a chance right out the gate, literally. Um, and, and my story is not – and that's, the, that's a, a big thing that I want to say is my story is not unique. Um, you know, while the specifics of it might be is there's – uh, it, uh, so many people that, you know, ultimately, here's the funny part. I, I, I got an amazing friend from Ontario. Me and him, we used to be on the yards in the 90s, 
acting a fool, kicking up dust, all that. I've known this guy for 20 years, but I knew his nickname and I knew his barrio. That's the extent of what I knew about him until we changed our lives. And now I meet the man. I know his name. I know uh, his mother. I know what he cares about. So just to highlight the depth of it, like I knew this man for 20 years, but I met him barely as a grown man in our 40s. Yeah. The actual man, you know, just to highlight the depth of what this lifestyle addiction, how deep and tangled up you can be in it. What do they say? No man ever steps in the same river twice where it is not the same man. It is not the same river. Exactly. Exactly. So, so hell That's yeah, good. dude. Um, that ultimately leads you to the notorious or infamous California justice system that I have gotten a bird's eye view since I've been out of employment for one year. And it is broken beyond beliefs. Can you... We have time, man. I want to dive into this. I'm already in this conversation, man. Um, you know, and the goal is to help others, dude, because I know you said your story wasn't unique, but that is what's going to help others, man, because so many have endured that. Exactly. The, the stuff you were experiencing as a juvenile when it came to detention, arrest, and corrections, would you say that that type of strategy worked or did not work? I mean, so at this time, we're talking the early 90s, which was like a purely like punishment based. It was go inside. Like, are we talking prison or juvenile at this point? Like juvenile to jail to prison. Yeah. Man, that when you're pushing through that process. Yeah. So when people always ask me what would it was like, you know, um, it, it was like when I opened up Salinas Valley, I, I got to um, D yard in 1996 when it opened. And it was basically um, buses coming in from Pelican Bay, high desert, New Folsom. I'm 18 years old. Like I'm. I'm keeping my mouth shut. My back is glued to the handball wall and I'm just observing, you know, but it's a madhouse. So what they would do, throw a handball on the, wall, on the, on the yard, a couple of basketballs, the yard recalls in three hours. <laughs> and, 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 you know, let the games begin. So me knowing a little something about prison, I know that when a new yard gets activated, we don't exactly send our best behaving inmates away right like i mean everybody we call it flushing the toilet like we we get rid of our yeah. problem child to that location did you sure. experience with it and i know that it takes some establishing in the beginning did you experience all sure. of that all yeah of that? i mean that was my baptism of fire into the uh, california department of corrections and i think we all did i mean it, it's a trip there were um you know, years later, right before I paroled from Ironwood at 45 years old, there's COs that came up through those ranks with me. I'd call them K number. Yeah, I'd be like, you're a K number two, fool. You know, like right. we joke around. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I heard the I heard the phrase. Have you heard carceral Darwinism? It's 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 the no. change. It's the growth with inside prison. It's the growth. Like I think COs go through it. Um, prisoners go through it. It's just the growth, like uh, the process of growing throughout the years, the decades, the change of prison and the evolution of it, you know. I never heard but that. But it I'm definitely have to research that. Yeah. Carcereal Darwinism. Cool. So from yeah. 18, damn, dude, you mentioned 18 to 45. That is, whew, that's a lifetime. Yeah. What, you it, said was, you, it was actually 16 to 45, but my prison, my prison career was that. Yeah, yeah. That's even worse, man. That's even more yeah. wild. Yeah, so yeah. talk to me about your mentality being that 18-year-old young man. Uh, with your back against the handball, observing. What was going through your head, man? So um, I was an eager gang member. I wanted to learn. I, I, I was dying to learn. And But there was also a part of me that that was, was in fear. This was a scary situation. I mean, I, I walked in. This is a time when uh, everybody's on the yard. Bulldogs, everybody's out there. And I'm looking at dudes. Their fists are bigger than my whole head. So I'm like, <laughs> wow, what am I involved in? So, you know, as a young 18-year-old kid in that environment, I remember um, I, I used to go through the Title 15 and maybe possibly look for a way out of there. Ultimately, I ended up going to see the commissioners. It was called a dock hearing at that time. I went in front of them and, and they said, okay, uh, we need you to get a GED. We need you to get a high school diploma, get a trade, uh, stay out of trouble, um, you know, things like that. And I said, if I do all those things right there, will I be able to go home one day? They laughed at me. They said, your parole officer hasn't even been born yet. And then they say there's like the governor, every governor, it's like he wants to run for president. So I turned back to the yard right there and I said, fuck this. Everything I need to learn is on this yard right here. And which is true. I was not going home. And they used to have phrases. Remember, you got all day. You're done. You're washed up. Somebody's got to go send a lifer. 
So there was zero hope. And I'm coming into this already like a just a jacked up, screwed up kid anyways. So and it, 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 it was just it was a horrible situation on top of another horrible situation. I am totally tracking with everything you said, man. What was your sentence? So I received 20 to life. It was um, 15 to life. I, I took it to trial. I went all the way. It was 15 life for the actual second degree murder and um, five years for the weapon. So my dad, my father was a CO. He started in 1993. When I would ask him back then, he said, yeah, man, they got a 20 to life. They got a L. They're never going home. Straight. One straight to life. Yeah. They're, they're never going home. And he firmly, yeah. he, the way he said it was, hey, and that was during that time frame. So I know exactly what you're talking about, man. And, and and the thing was, is like, it, it was just a different, uh, like, breed of even officers and because they had, it was just, a, it was, there was no, there was no hope. It was, it was warfare in there. And it was, and you just walked out there and it, it was thick, man. I, I, I'm hoping that the, ga the audience gathers that environment. I'm sure they do, man. To have a prison full of hopeless men is bad dude it's a ear it's it's fucking violent it's bad and like you said man there's no there's no fear of consequence but because what really more consequence could you give a man i mean uh, th there is no consequence because you know you 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 do you, you commit a violent act and, and there's nothing but rewards and praise wow i mean what you go to the hole that i i was dying to go to the hole that's college i was Talking dying to go to pelican bay that's harvard Okay. You know, um, Corcoran was Stanford. I've heard it's, numerous individuals say that. Talk to me about how you saw your life playing out. Like you said, hey, one day I'm going to make it to college, Pelican Bay. Yeah. Well, it's just, it, you know, it, it's part of like the learning process when you go in there. And, you know, I, I take complete responsibility right. for my thought process and, and how I evolved. But, you know, I came to see myself as a soldier in an army. I, I came to see that as my promotion. I was looking for that. And again, I'm I was still a young kid just dying for a pat on the back. You know, get the older homie or something. Just ask right, little homie. Oh, I thrived on that. That meant anything. I would have done anything to get that. And I and I continue to, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Is there anything, and I've never really asked anybody this, and, you know, out of respect, but since you're out, I can ask you this. Is there anything sure. that you missed while you were in there? Anything that you missed from the streets where you're like, man, I could really, wi I really wish I was home doing this or, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, my, my entire life, I mean, I, I, I remember at one point I, I had, I had already, I was living in my change at that point. I had, you know, a new mind state when I say that, I mean, I had a new mind state, but I remember I, I would receive pictures from my nephews. I had three nephews and they were seven, eight, and maybe 10 at the time. And I would have to turn the picture around and read their names to see which nephew it was. And that's when I realized like, wow, like, this is what you missed. And then I lost my grandparents. Like, these are the people. My grandparents traveled those grapevines up north for 20 years. You know, they, when, I got, when I got convicted, they bought a special van just because they knew wow. this is our life now. This is what it's going to have to be. So, um, you know, that's a big part of my message, too, is, you know, we always say, well, you know, we can handle this and it's about us. But we forget we're dragging our family and right. all these people behind us. Right. Those are the consequences, you know. Right, right. During that time frame. What was the California Department of Corrections doing wrong, doing wrong during that time frame? Like you can look back and you can be like, nah, that, that, that's fucked up. That program's fucked up or hey, they're doing, they're, they're, this is foul over here. Yeah. I mean, so it, at, at this time it was Salinas Valley, a newly opened 180 yard and it, it was similar everywhere. It was just a um, purely a us first them mentality. I mean, you would see from the administration all the way to the top would right. just wait there'd be a murder, there'd be something, slam us down for two years, no food, no packages, and then come back up. And it was just, it was the us first mentality thing. Like that's when there was like really serious staff assaults, like things that didn't necessarily have to happen, Correct. but it was the mentality that drove it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it was just, I mean, the only thing I could say is just the most cancer, toxic, corrupted situation on, on on from blue to green on both sides it was it was really bad and this was the time of when i was there in salinas on it was thanksgiving day when the big um assault i wasn't i was on the other side of the yard but we went locked down forever they had a huge salt on staff yeah. it was something like 30 on one which evolved into um a serious right us first them like it was it, it, it was battles and, and cell extractions and 
it was huge. And ultimately that book came out of it. You know, there was a book that right, came right, out right. of it, uh, like the green wall. Right. But that was that that played out through the entire time while I was there in Salinas. No, I, I'm tracking and I agree with you because I, I remember blue versus green. You know, I came in in 2006. I'm not an OG or anything, but it was blue versus green. Still um, very much so at that time. I mean, that 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 it was still very much the same uh, culture at that time. Correct. Correct. And you're right. That does drive like, hey, when you kick it off, we're going to kick it off. Right. It's almost like fucking inmate on inmate behavior. If you really think about it. Um, yeah. And when you see people would come, like, it, it would be yard release and you could see everybody's like, you know, everybody's too still. You're ready for it. You know, you're in your mind, you know, I'm a Sureño and it's combat time and it's warfare. I'm ready to go out with the homies. And the CO's like, it's going to jump off and we got each other's back. And it's right. just, the, the, the energy was horrible. <laughs> you know, it was. That shit stresses you out, man. Like I got, you know, it makes your hairline recede and shit. That shit makes you get white hair. <laughs> hey, no, literally, dude. Hey, speak on everything, man. <laughs> Tell me about it. Brother. Literally, that shit, the, the, the high, the, um, you know, the high blood pressure, the f being turned up all the time. I'm getting chills just talking about it because that's why COs die after three years of retiring because their heart is operating at that fucking level. Yeah. And I, I remember at the time there, I, there was a, a, an officer who um, like he came through, um, you know, I won't say his name. I'll tell you um, when we get yeah, off. Yeah, but yeah. He came he came through the entire like almost my whole sense. And he ended up committing suicide, man. And it was terrible because the trip is, is I remember. um you know, telling one of the guys in the yard one day, like we went through the same things. Like his traumas are the same. Like he's right. seen that mini 14. Like I was there when, when he was fighting that dude and got shot. Like it's crazy. Right. The toll it took. And that's why I look at it now. Like we were just all in, in survival mode for so long. Pawns, man. Pawns. In, pawns. In, pawns in that fucking big game that, you know, that I always, all of us, about. all of yeah. us. I'm, I, I look back now and I'm like, I hated that CO for what? What did right. that dude ever do to me? He was clocking in, doing his time. Yeah, yeah. Not you know? tracking. You mentioned lockdowns. As you know, sure. as you know, lockdowns pretty much got phased out, man. Yeah. Uh, so you experiencing those two years lockdowns. <clears throat> because I know you said you would eventually go off to the shoe. But I'm not talking about th that type of lockdown. I'm talking about the You're two year, about the two year yeah. ones. Is that an effective measure? Oh, I'm glad actually. I'm glad actually we're talking, man, because people are yeah. tired of hearing me talk. Is locking an inmate down for two years an effective measure to get whatever point the administration wants to get out? So, if if, if there's a problem on the yard, if, if something's going on, if there's friction, if there's a bunch of violence happening, to stuff these people inside of a box for two years and then just open the doors back mm -hmm. up and expect something different to happen, like what are you thinking? Seriously. What are you thinking? You're not giving them anything. You're opening their door three times a day. You're handing them their shit on a shingles. You're giving them their dinner and their lunch. And you're going to get a shower every three days. You're going to cuff them. You're going to walk them down the tier. You're going to put them in the shower, slam the door, uncuff them. That's the extent of your program. That just reinforces the soldier mentality. And I'm in a war and okay, wait till we get off. And you're just obsessing over this stuff. Highly, highly dangerous situation highly this dangerous shit, this shit's gold right here dude i never even seen that you know what i mean like i didn't see it like that way you're just you're going away and we're opening the door and you're coming right back out the same way you came in oh, the only difference is i've been doing water bag and burpees and for burpees two years and now i'm a fucking self. beast right. yeah now, now, now i'm gonna hit harder i'm gonna move faster <laughs> like and, and i'm still in this whacked out mentality fucking a dude so you're in prison you're young you ain't got no hope it's violent you eventually make your way up to real quick. Let me see. Is there anything in the Salinas Valley area you want to touch on? Again, we don't have to dive into politics or anything personal, sure. but like anything that stands out where you're like, damn, that shit was crazy. Or I learned this. Or it... Yeah. I mean, as, as I look back as, as difficult of a time that is for me, because uh, I mean, you know, I, I see all these guys on YouTube telling these tough guy prison stories. I was terrified. I was surrounded by like 400 stone killers that will kill you in a drop of a hat. So as I look back now, I, I sort of appreciate it because if you're a lifer and your entire life is going to be in prison, let might as well start at, at, at the main spot, meet, meet, meet the best people, you know, per that uh, lifestyle and culture, learn as much as you can. So I'm appreciative of it at the time though. Um, you know, it, it, I think today um, I'm still dealing with stuff right. that, 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 occurred at that time that happened and you know things in the in, in the mine and stuff 
we we always will, man. I had a Vietnam veteran tell me one time, Hector, that shit's gonna stay with you forever till the day you die. So that kind of put yeah. me at ease knowing that hey, this motherfucker's with me, right? So yeah, yeah. Let's talk about overcrowding, overcrowding and overpopulation. When I came in, there was gyms filled, there was bunk beds on the day room. Did how did what was your experience with that? Exactly. So in 2006, I was in SADF. I was on C Yard. The gyms were packed. <laughs> I'm talking what, the, those triple stack bunks. You had the guy in the coffin in the middle. It, it was insane. And it, and it would impact the program negatively because overcrowding. Now these guys are on the gym, these level one and level two guys. And now you're taking our yard. So now everybody's pissed. How are these fucking guys getting our yard? Right. They're level one guys. But in a way, it works, too, because now you're on our yard. Now you work for us. Now you're exactly. going to do what we do. So exactly. let's corrupt you guys, and we're going to, you know, it, it, give and take. But the yeah. overcrowding was difficult, too, because the selling situations, like, they'd have uh, situations where they they need bed space. And there's guys, you know how it is. Some guys just don't want sellies or, right. for whatever reason, refuse them. or the, But you have to cram them in because count time's coming. Oh. You need to close that bar box, whatever the case is. So you need to get these guys in here. And multiply that by a hundred across multiple prisons and it, it added on to all the other stuff that we've just been talking about oh my god the feds came in that shows how bad it was facts facts yeah now you're just reminding me of how bad it was or well, how yeah how wild it was you know what i mean like and again i'm not comparing it to the 90s because i never worked the 90s but that's a time frame that we're talking about right here like that 2006 7 so then you find yourself in the shoe. You said, how long did you spend there? So I spent nine years in um, Corcoran shoe. Corcoran uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was picked up by IGI in uh, 2008 from Kern Valley State Prison, transferred over to Corcoran, where I essentially sat in my tomb. Let me ask you this. Did you notice a change in goon squad officers, ISU, IGI over the years? compared to how they were to the past to uh... yeah I, I would say more um and uh, i'm trying to so, so mr sloan had the greatest more uh they, back then they were more rambo now they're more jedi that's that's the way i would say it but i will say this i remember having a conversation i i was in the shower and um you know the ig officer was was talking to me and he's you know he, he made his offer now's your time you can go over here and live a good life and i you know I get it. You got to make that offer. I appreciate it, but I'm going to stay on, on the course that I'm on. <laughs> Correct. And 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 he, and and he says, you know what our goal is? Our goal is to get 50 percent of you guys telling on the other 50 percent. And I said, wow. And and it and it actually made sense because ultimately I got validated. They put me in the shoe. And as I was, I'm an avid reader, voracious reader, uh, thousands of books um, on, on a multitude of topics. So I always had books, and I would write my name on the side, my CDC number, and I would pass them off when I'm done. Every book I passed off got validated because I'm validated and it's an association to me. No way, dude. Yeah, wow. I, I got about, yeah, I had to write about 10 apology uh, wheelers. Like, you know, I, I had no idea. Because uh, yeah, at this point, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an associate correct. on paper, on paper. Correct. And granted, I, I was anything but an angel. I, 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 yeah. I, I was, I was, yeah, I was a complete headache. I was destructive. And, but on paper, I sounded like, wow. I sounded like a complete maniac, you know. But, but they were literally giving dudes points just for you sharing a book. They would validate them, yeah, because I, I'm, I'm a validated associate, right. and and clearly they're associating with me. Or you know, sometimes we'll share addresses. Yeah. Now, were we innocent people? Were we still um, involved in crime? Yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, um, it, it was what it was. But ultimately, the goal was for fifty percent telling the other fifty, and it worked. It ended up being like ninety telling on ten percent. Did you read more books on the main line or when you were down in the shoe? Um, I would say the shoe only because the amount of time that I had in my cell, but I, I always had a book in my hand. I was always, um, always reading. What did you do on a daily occurrence to not go crazy and lose your damn mind in a box? What tricks? Yeah, um, that's, that was the perfect word. You literally have to have tricks. Right. Because, you know, I, I, sometimes I share this story. I'd be in the Corcoran shoe. And I'd be up just doing the things you do to pass time. I'd roll my mat up, I'd tie it, do a little workout, I'd make some picture frames, I'd read a book and like absent minded. And I'd look up and it's dark. They're coming, it's like 10 hours had gone by. And that was so scary for me. 
So for me, it was, it's always about routine. And I had a good family. I had a good foundation, which I was blessed with. But wake up. I, I you know, I'm a Sureño, so we got to program. We have to program. And, and, and I understand now uh, the benefits of it. You have to wake up. You have to read. You, and, and I was motivated to do that. So ultimately, it kind of just became a part of my life. Even after I said, man, this stuff is, you know, kind of not really what I'm about anymore. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between military and uh, inmates, man. A lot of similarities. The waking up. Well, we read. I mean, yeah, I used to read those books and try to adapt right. them to my lifestyle. You know, Colin Powell Soldier was, was you know, a great book and uh, that I remember reading. But, yeah, all those military, you know how it was. We, we always had those books. How important is physical fitness, was physical fitness for you during that time and in your incarceration? Yeah, sure. So physical fitness always, um, it, it, my mental, the way I felt, my confidence, who I was. Like, I remember when I was in SADF at that time, I had broke my ankle on the basketball court and I never felt more vulnerable in my life, you know, despite um, what I had in my cast down there. It, you just feel super vulnerable. So you want to be in shape, you want to be good. And then, you know, there were many times where I was severely addicted to heroin, where I wasn't working out, I was strung out. Um, in, in really bad shape. I never even asked this. Like we kind of brushed over it. I mean, are you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, did 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 you have an addiction? Are you an addict? Sure. I mean, you don't mind me asking? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a recovering addict. So <clears throat> this is a story. Okay, I can't believe I just passed over this. When I was in Salinas Valley, I'm a white boy. You know, I'm I'm, I'm from a Hispanic neighborhood. When I went in there, um, you know, I represented you know the number yeah, thirteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I went in there, there was a point where I was working in the kitchen. A riot took place on the yard. It was a riot between the whites and the blacks. Now, the way the program was at the time, the official, uh, the administration says, what we're going to do is we're going to run program one day for the Southerners and the blacks only. And then the following day, we're going to let the whites and the Northerners and the others out. And we're just going to wait and you know, let the politics play out and just, I guess, see how it shakes out and ultimately find a solution. Now, I'm working in the kitchen in the morning. So I was approached and they say, look, you're a white boy. You're kind of new. You're not established. The COs don't know who you are. You're a youngster. There's the potential your door might open with these blacks. Boom. Slid under the door. Just in case. Have this. Okay. Sure enough, three days later, my door opened. Remember in the morning, yeah, the yeah. door racks a little bit. James, get ready uh, for the kitchen. Oh, it's going to happen. My celly jumps up, gives me a hug. I stick the weapon in my pocket. I'm walking through the rotunda. What I didn't know is, uh, you know, the African-American guys through B-section saw my door coming. They were planned. They were thinking the same way we were. I walked in the rotunda. They were on me. Stabbed God me 27. Damn. Stabbed me 27 times. Yeah. I had, the, I had the weapon on me. I didn't get to pull it. Yeah, they were on me. <sighs> I don't mean to laugh, but I I literally no. asked you, is there anything major that happened hey. in Salinas Valley? And yeah, you're like, woof. Hey, yeah. dude, that just shows how gangster you are, man. No pun, inten <laughs> no pun intended, but like, holy yeah. shit, dude. Yeah, yeah. What the and, fuck? And and here's the crazy part about it. This is this is what the '90s were about. And you know, I, I told you my mindset at the time, so I I, I didn't. There was no, I understood with these guys, they're, they're warriors. They did what they were supposed to do. Correct. They caught me slipping. They hopped on me and they tore my ass up. I mean, I'm like 19 at this time. These are 45 year old men shoving steel in me. So I go to the 115 hearing, you know, and, and like a, like a good convict, I said, these guys didn't do it. Those are my friends right there. I work in the kitchen with these right. guys. And per policy at that time, if the victim is saying no, it's a not guilty. <laughs> Hell yeah. It's man. insane. It was, a, it was a not guilty for them. And. Wow. You know, they you, you sign your chronos, they go to your yard. You never cross paths again because of, um, you know, enemies and stuff like that. But uh, was mutual just, respect uh, like that common? At that, it was. Oh, it was huge. It was, and people would always like, uh, you know, my mom and them and visit would be like, "Why are you guys so respectful?" Because they would, hey, excuse me, I apologize, and you know, do you mind? Like right. over respectful because the smallest slight right. could result in in multiple deaths. I'm, I'm talking as far right. as. Jumping in front of someone and ordering a fucking Butterfingers because this guy was waiting. The, the level of pride at, and, and was, was so heavy at the time, you know, disrespecting my principles. And it just snowballs into chaos. Oh, fuck, dude. I, I mean, shit, that was fucking nuts, man. So did, you got hit in the rotunda. Yeah, I got hit in the rotunda coming out of C-section. Yeah. C1, Salinas Valley. 
and you never saw those dudes again. It's like, nah, those nah. dudes, nah, they didn't, nah, it's, they didn't do it. It's all good. Everything's cool. I mean, you know, granted, yeah, had right, I done, right. you know, yeah, you know, no, I get it. It would have been reciprocated, but um, I got it. Like they, they, you know, they were the better gangster warriors that day. They got me, and I, and I'm a rookie. I'm 19 years old. I'm rookied up, man. You know, I like how you said that. Right, because there's currently a problem in the department now with these new officers that I like to call Starbucks baristas. Their mind isn't in that warrior mindset, right? The problem comes when somebody is in that warrior mindset and is willing to go all the way. You don't know how far the next man's willing to go. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and more so for the. I think it, the danger comes for the officers on like on those four yards. Right. You know. Uh, you know. It's, I'm, I'm out of time. I've been off the four yards. I, 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 got, I did four yards for about 25 years. I got a good behavior override. Um, I did the Ironwood for three years and I paroled. So I've kind of been, you know, five years. But I did notice a big change in the officers, like the mentalities. But look at the department in general has just become like correct, soft, correct. but not. Correct, correct. You know, yeah, no, actually, these days, the four yards are not as dangerous as, like, an EOP yard, a mentally unstable JK. Oh, yard. yeah. They're, those are well, that was wild. the consequence. That, 50, that that 5150 is the consequences of, I need 50 you guys telling on the others. Correct. And it, you know, I'm sure we'll get into it. It's, it backfired so crazy. So many gangs spawned out of that. Let's get into that now. As far as you're in Corcoran, shoe, you went into Corcoran knowing a certain... California Department of Corrections, when you came out with a different? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, I came out post-hunger strike. Um, I participated in that. I received a write-up for that. Um, that was what, that, that was the thing, too, because I, I, I was already um, working to rewire myself. And, you know, my last write-up was for a weapon uh, in 2013. That shows how deep the indoctrination was, because I remember telling myself at some point, that's it. I'm not going to use violence anymore. I'm not going to stab nobody, but I'll hold the weapon for him. I'll pass the weapon for him if they need it, you know, because right. and I'm thinking, yeah, like I'm thinking I, this, I'm doing I'm a good guy now, you know, <laughs> until I get the write up. And I'm yeah. thinking, here you are in the same damn place. I, you know, I, I went to court. I got an additional five years for that weapon. God damn. But um, yeah, yeah. When did the lifers, because as I know we're talking, I'm trying to get the time frame going, give or take. When did the lifers start getting uh, action? When you started hearing rumors like, hey, old, yeah. boy, old boy went home or this dude got action. When, when was that time frame and what yeah. was that like for you? So um, I, I was in Corcoran Shoe at the time and I remember I, I went out to medical one time and, and I see one of the fellas in the holding tank and he goes, hey, fool, you're going home. And I, I, I never heard that in my entire life. Right. I mean, I'm going home. This is JK. I talk about I'm going home. And he goes, they passed the new law. They're letting all the juveniles go home ASAP. Now, I know that probably wasn't the case, but okay, it, I heard it. Right. On my way back, somebody yelled at me from another building. He said, fool, you're going home. So something snapped. So I started looking it up, and I, and I, I received information about this law called SB 260. And then uh, about a week later, I get a ducat that in, in the shoe, in the corporate shoe that says special event. Now, if you're in the hole or you're in the shoe, the only event you're going to have is walking to another cage. That's right. the extent of, of the events that you're going to have for decades, years, whatever. That's that's what's going to go on. So I went out there and they had this whole team of Scott Budnick and Elizabeth Calvin and um, all the nemesis of CDCR came in and explained to us, Frankie Carrillo explained to us this law. Scott Budnick said, hey, check this out, pulled out the first laptop I'd ever seen in my life. Wow. Spun it around, and he said, look at these dudes right here. And I'm looking at the Supreme Court, the front steps of the Supreme Court, and I'm seeing dudes tatted but in suits and all that. He said, all those dudes are lifers. They all came home this year. At that moment, instantly, I said, I need to change my fucking life. What year was Done. that? I, this is 2013, close to 14. So you I had just gone, you. yeah. Oh, go ahead. You know, I said I had just gone to board. I got a seven-year denial. Um, you know, I, I went in there and said, uh, you know, are you involved in gangs and crime? I said, absolutely not, sir. Absolutely not, sir. I've, I've been a model prisoner, you know, and I thought yeah. they bought it until they smacked me with, uh, righteously what I deserved a seven year denial. And then shortly afterwards is when Scott Budnick showed you the laptop. Yeah. That's when I saw the laptop. I heard about the law. They broke it down for us. And I says, wow, I saw a glimpse, but 
that was the problem. If you're in the shoe, it was still snitch, parole, or die. Right. Okay. You're not. You're, you're not going home. So it was the following year that I I'm hearing buzz about a, a peaceful hunger strike. Okay. So I'm saying, okay, maybe this is the way out. I'm still not trying to uh, attach myself to like huge like movements that are. Cause, you know, I'm I'm just I'm trying to make it home to my family at this point. But I said, okay, I have an opportunity to just sit back in my bunk, say no, thank you. I'll pass on my trade today. You know, yeah. I wonder. I mean, I'm a firm I'm a firm believer in things happen for a reason. You know, you got yeah. you got hit with that seven year denial. I wonder, you know, if God or somebody else put something, you know, that gave you that hope right afterwards, so that you didn't spiral down the drain. You know, with that that negative, you know, that negative news that you had received. Sure, I mean, with with without the hope, all I had was what I had, what I what I always had, and what I was tired of, and 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 that's the. That's the trippy part about it is when they opened that door and revealed that hope, I saw dudes like myself, like 20 plus year veterans who just covered in just state soap and dust from the yard and just the chaos of prison immediately say, this is what we've been waiting for. I haven't been wanting to do this my whole life, but I've had no other option. So, okay, let's, you know, and I immediately uh, began that path of trying to find out who in the hell Brian is because I put him away almost 40 years at that point. I, I seen that hope, man. I seen that hope in your guys' eyes and the, the, the demeanor. I used to work in the clinic and I had a porter in there and he would tell me like, hey, man, I'm getting action. Here's all my legal paperwork. I would be like, ah, come on, in my head, right? Like, I don't yeah. know, man. I don't know. But yeah, dude, yeah, it fucking floodgates. And I, it was a trip because I used to, all, you know, all the COs on the yard right there, they'd be like, damn, what a trip. Like, you're fucking going home. Like, because I mean, I've been knowing these guys for like 15 years, you know? Yeah. And they're tripping out on it too. And it's hard for them because it was so hard for everybody to believe it's actually happening. And along with that, that law came the whole self help programming. Ooh. The animals started coming in. It was just everything. So good. We we talked about what didn't work, right? Uh, two year, two year lockdowns because that was kind of pointless and actually uh, aggravated the factors. Um, giving hope to hopeless individuals did work, and that was positive. Now talk to me about you get out. The dynamics of prison have changed. You're seeing these programs. What type of programs did you see? What type of programs did you participate in? And were they beneficial? So when I got out, I was immediately, I, I was starving for information. I, I wanted to start my new life. I wanted to begin my journey to go home. Um, and, and you're doing that in the climate of there's, there's, there's Narcotics Anonymous, Criminal Gang Members Anonymous, Healing Dialogue. Like there, there's all these programs. But at the same time in the air is they're just, they're emptying out these shoes. And the word is there's going to be a bloodbath. So everybody's gearing up for something. And it wasn't really happening. Correct. Not yet. You know, I mean, I, I it's, I, I haven't been in there, but according to what I see on YouTube, it's getting kind of crazy. But at the time, it hadn't happened yet, you know, yeah. and but everybody was really tense about it. Me, I just began diving into these these groups. And I remember going to these groups, man, and like I'd be walking across the yard with my folder going to my Narcotics Anonymous or something that just right there in the yard. They're just booking the shit out of someone. I'm just like, I got to get the fuck out of here i'm trying to get to the level three you know and and you can't even make it to group because it was just it, it, was, it was brutal it's particularly on those four yards that's a powerful statement man that's a powerful comment because that's the reality of fucking california prisons right there dude yeah people ask yeah. me people ask me for advice like let me ask let me ask you because since people ask me they're like hey hector how would i survive a prison you know if i just want to get there and leave how the fuck do i do it right without getting in a wreck without fucking you know, is that is it possible from your perspective? I mean, you're you're not going to go in and come out unscathed. <laughs> I mean, hopefully the level of damage done to you. I mean, if you're going into CDCR at this time, like you're going to come out. Uh, yeah, a little a little fucked up uh, a lot or a little because it's just chaos in there right now. Whoa. It's chaos in there. And but it's understandable, too, because you, you figure just decades and decades of one thing and, and Cause, and I saw that I was part of the, the, when Hillary Clinton was calling me a super predator and things mm. like that, and just lock them up, shut the doors and that's it. You know, um, like I remember the COs you say, that's my job to, to lock you up and count you. Right, right, right. And, and, and that, that was the job, but it, to completely reverse that and to try to push this, you know, it's called the Norway or yeah. the, the self-help programming. 
there's so much pushback and it's it's such an entrenched system it's gonna be like this i think probably for a while i hope not but I, i'm glad i have you on here man because people need to hear it from you your perspective your words i am for rehabilitation right you said rehabilitative programs have benefited you tremendously and others which is correct absolutely but is there a way i guess you just said it right now you ain't gonna come out unscathed I mean, is there a way that you can put into words like, yeah, there is um, there is rehabilitative programs happening, but maybe they're going about it the wrong way and they're putting, again, GPs on S&Y yards and S&Ys on GP yards from your perspective? So um, it, it, it's been it's always been my opinion that um, the result of the, the, the hunger strike and people getting released from the shoe and that sort of force because – I, you know, the officers don't like to get up and, and have to walk across the yard and, and key a door because we'd have right. to ask them a million times. They'd be like, fuck. So I know they don't. I, I was the pain in the ass. Right. Hey, can we get the chapel open, education? And they don't like that. But that was a direct result of, I believe, the release from the shoe, the, the forcing of this Norway model. And trip out on this, of everybody that got a piece of the pie in prison, everybody got a piece of the pie except the officers. They didn't get a group. They didn't get no additional that I know of. And I used to tell them that you can't have a change and leave these guys back in the 90s. You know? Oh, shit. Everybody got a piece of like the prison reform. I, I used to have this. There was an officer in my floor cop, really cool dude. We used to have that yeah. conversation. And he says, like, when I go in the yard, like, you don't think I see a youngster and I know him for three years. So when he gets stabbed on the yard and I got to pick his bloody body up and escort him across the yard, that shit doesn't affect me. I watched that kid go from 18 to 21. Right. You know, so my point is, is with this whole prison reform, everybody got a piece, but you have to include everybody if you're going to keep this thing going in the right direction, which it, you know, clearly is not at the time. You said you were involved in the pooch program. Yeah. Um, so when, ultimately, when I did get out of the shoe, it was in 2018. I signed up for the positive change dog program. Right, right. Um, yeah. Uh, first, first uh, dog program on a level four general population yard. We were supposed to have failed. The wow. warden came up. Yeah, the warden came onto the yard one time and said, I appreciate you guys. Because now when you Google Corcoran, instead of the gladiator fights, this damn dog program comes up. So I mean, that was a moment for me right there, too. You know? Dude, I never knew that they had that program on uh, level four GP. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. Successful. We did two rounds. That's good, dude. Yeah. That, that's yeah. honestly good, man. <laughs> yeah. When we There's can... some problems. That's one of the programs that actually works, you know, when you're trying to meet the quota and just put some random programs together just to, you know, check that box. That's well, where it, everybody loves dogs, man. Dogs to me are more loyal than humans, but uh, yeah, every, everybody loves dogs, man. The companionship and loyalty. Yeah. From when you told me you were a youth indoctrinated on a one way path to your mind shifting getting the hope scott budnick shows you the laptop lifers are out on the streets what new stuff did you did did you learn about yourself talking about emotions trauma yeah. stuff like that so i you know i i came to understand the things like why i became the way i became i understood like if you know ultimately my father died of a, a heroin overdose the week of my trial, I had not much contact with them. So, and my mom ended up getting clean, but I ended up understanding that it, it was their addiction, not me. Um, I understanding that um, why I chose the gang, why I was looking for that stuff, why I, why I wanted that, um, which I still want today. Only now I'm not willing to compromise my values to get it. That's the difference. But I understood myself and I understood my triggers. I understood when somebody screams at me. You know, I used to get screamed at when I was little and it would drive me crazy. I, oh, today, that's still the case. So yeah. I, I know what's going on and I have skills. So when it happens, I got different things that I could do to respond instead of react. And I mean, I came out here with a ton of emotional intelligence and life skills. The point now is just executing upon them and not reverting back, which is the easy route. And sometimes it's really hard not to with some of these freaking idiots out here. But um, yeah, that's the, that's that's what I'm out here doing. Just executing on, on all the stuff I spent. I spent seven years. My only goal, my only job was to get to know myself. Life Hell paused. Yeah. I was I was going to like five groups a day. I'm reading books. I just wanted to become, I wanted to make my grandmother proud. That was my goal. And I wanted to go home. And when I went to board, I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. 
every question they asked me, I had already asked myself probably a hundred times. So you, you legitimately devoted seven years to um, learning yourself and then hitting that shit hard. So when the pro, when, when the commissioner said, you're denied, we're giving you a seven year, but he says, look, man, you got a lot of work to do. I see it in your eyes. I hear in your voice, something there, there's something there. You're reaching for something. I see where you want to go in life, but you got a long road, dude. You're really fucked up. You've been lying to me this whole time, but you got support. You said some really good things that have, that have um, given me hope. So stay on your path. And when he said that, I said, oh, wow, I could go home. That's all I needed. That's all I needed. And I might have been on that path when I first went at 18. If they would have said, look, do 20 years straight. Get this done and we'll let you go home. I would have done it. I, 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 wanna, I hope I would have done it. You, did you say you eventually got an, an override? Did you say you got an override? Yes. Yeah, so I did um, 24, 25 years um, on level fours. Uh, I, yeah, when I, when I got out of the shoe, I went to committee. I talked to the captain. I said, hey, man, I'm doing great. He said, ah, you just got out. You got a long history. Give me another year. Let's see how you do. I did the dog program. I was involved in college. All, all the, I grafted to you all the, the, the positive stuff on the yard, and uh, I got my good behavior override. I went to Ironwood. That's cool, man. That's cool. Lately, I've been going on a tangent on my YouTube channel about how level four overrides are dangerous. And again, I, I hate blanket statements because you have just proven to me, right, that, that you're an exception. And clearly, that's not the case for everybody. But I've, I've been involved in some <laughs> bullshit, man. Attempted murder. Okay, yeah. Attempted murders on peace officers were level sure. fours were overridden on a level three. Um, again, from your perspective and talking about the California Department of Corrections, is there a way they can better maybe do that? Or is it always, you're always just going to be rolling the dice on who's who, what's what? Um, I mean, one thing that I would say, like, like it's, when we talk about like blanket statements too, I hear a lot of people and I always make this um, statement that maybe a lot of people don't agree, but I think the prisoner class, the prisoners, that's the only like segment of society that a person can openly discriminate against with zero consequences. Um, in terms of what was the question one more time? Sorry the about that. The question was, is there anything? Yeah. Is, I mean, because we can't, we don't have a crystal ball, right? We can't sure. look to the future of like, who's going to do better yet. I think you had mentioned to me before, like, hey, there's some dudes that do need to stay in prison, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. do you think there is, there's a possible way to find out who's who or what's what? Or, I mean, it's just, I mean, I don't think, I don't think there is. Well, here's, here's the thing is I had to earn, I had to earn my way And When I was in the shoe, I was the worst of the worst. That was my title. Uh, a month later, I was on yard crew with a, with a, with an ax in my hand, yeah, yeah. breaking up dirt, you know? Yeah. But the point is, is I, 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 I earned that, you know, you, you can't just say, uh, Hey, send me to a level three override. Because like I told you before, and, and I said it a million times, there's dudes in there that I do not want out here around my family or my people. They're dangerous people. They're just not ready to come out yet. I was that person. Damn. Thank God. I, prison is the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm so glad they didn't let me out on that first. If he would have let me out on that first pro board, if that liquor store drag, I tried to run on that man worked and they would have let me out. Oh my God. It, it, it would have been the worst thing for society, me, my family, everybody. I just wasn't ready. So it's hard too, because, you know, people are such fickle people. You never know situations in prison, you know, they explode like the yard's quiet within 10 seconds. There's somebody laying there just bloody within seconds. So you never know. That's the hard part of it. And I think you maybe just, just got to accept that part of the reality, but I think yeah. people need to go through a process to earn it. Hey, this guy's been programmed pretty solid for about three years. Um, you know, he worked up at the program or in the gym and, you know, uh, officer so-and-so said, you know, he seemed like pretty, and yeah. you know, you do stuff like that. When I went to parole, I used to have COs, the board would call over there to Ironwood and say, what's up with this guy? Who's he hanging out with on the yard? Yeah, and yeah. I think that's gotta be part of it, but the seals are not involved. You have to, the seals are there. I spend half of my life, like my day, like with eight hours, 12 hours with these right. seals. So I think they, it's important for them to be involved in maybe in the conversation. I think they should have some say so. There it is. I, the thing, you just hit the nail on the head, man. Because, yeah, as, as peace officers, COs, and Green, we know, 
we know who has changed their lives, right? We see it. We've had conversations on the 100%. yard. We continuously 100%. have conversations on the yard, right? And then there's dudes we straight up avoid like the plague because they're all bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's the answer to me right there is let the officers and or sergeants or lieutenants give an input, uh, whatever fucking drastic decision the committee wants to make. And, you know, despite like, you know, unfortunately the devastating thing that happened over there in Iowa, that was like a really good model where in the relationships with the officers, it felt like I used to always call it like a, a college campus with just extreme security. The relationships, like for those of us in the, um, in the self-help world, because the, the, the criminal element was in the minority there at the time. It was all about when you drove up, it was before the paper was like, hey, what college class are you in? Do you oh, want to get cool. in? It was, that, that's it was cool. But that was a, that that was just the one place. Like if, if, if you could do that somewhere else, ultimately I think you could affect CDCR, but those things are just little pockets that are by themselves and isolated. I was on Delta Yard at Donovan. That was an SNY yard, but it still had, well, never, it had the mentality of a program. However, there was a shitload of fucking drugs on that fucking yard, let me tell you. Yeah. But again, yeah. I, guess, I, guess, I guess it's one of those things, man. You can't have one without the other, dude. The fucking yeah. yin and the yang. That uh, the drugs were, man. I when I was in Ironwood too, we had like seven overdoses. Yep. We had three deaths. It, yep. it it was horrible, and that was the time too. I remember the administration called everybody in, said, "What do we do?" And I think that was the moment that we kind of all sat together. It, it wasn't necessarily a Mac rep meeting, but they called a bunch of prisoners and said, like people are dying. Like the seals are tired of dragging people out dead. We're, you know, everybody's tired of losing people, and so like a dialogue kind of began. But yeah, I think everybody that's on a yard of blue and green, they, everybody has to have a stake in it. Now, can we can we get to that point? Are people hard headed? Are the are the are the powers that be going to say you know fuck them? And you right. know what I mean? That's um, the thing. Now, walk us, tell us about when the time you got action. Like, what was it like? You you had a board hearing, or how did that go down? Yeah. So um, when they denied me, they said you're gonna. I, I was denied in. Well, I, I think 15 or, or something. They said, you're going to go to board in 2022 in February. So I, I, I had my date and uh, I, I, I got to work. And when that date grew closer and closer, all my friends, I'm talking like, uh, I mean, these are dudes that just blasted just over the years that have just completely changed their, their lives are going to board and they're getting released. I'm like, these are my peers. Like, you know, I, I came in at 18 with this dude and I'm watching him go home. And I was just waiting my turn. It was so, so hard because I probably saw about 30 dudes with 30 years and over go home. And I remember being so happy for them, but you also want your turn. You're dying for your yeah. turn. So ultimately my turn came. I was, I was ready. So when I went to board, I go in there. Um, I talked to my attorney first and he says, um, they just switched the commissioners on you. They put the gang commissioner on you. It's going to be an entire hearing about gangs and confidential information. Postpone it. I told him, dude, don't tell me no shit like that. And I hung up on him. I'm ready. This is my life. Like, uh, um, and I talked to um, people on the yard in terms of, because you have to go in there and be blunt. You have to be honest about your life and what you've done. And, and that's what I intended on doing. And, and, you know, that's what I made known that I was going to do. I was going to take complete responsibility for everything I did. So when I went in there, he opened up. He says, look, I have 25 pieces of confidential information on you. We're going to go by them piece by piece. And I want to hear what you have to say. If at any point you lie, you know that's deception. If I don't believe you, that's deception. And I'm still going to look at you as a criminal. I said, yes, sir. So we went piece by piece. Were you sneaking drugs into the ASU through legal mail? Yes, sir. Why? Because I was a drug addict. Because I wanted to make money. I wanted my peers to pat me on the back when I, when I fished heroin down the tier to them. I wanted to be the fucking guy. And I was. And it was amazing. Well, what about now? Do you still want to be the guy? Yes, but for completely opposite reasons what's the next one hey were you involved in the assault on so-and-so um at this time yes sir i was why because i was a follower and i wanted acceptance and they asked me to do it and i didn't have the courage to say no so at some point i came to who i was in life where i was done you know, I, I, my, it was about my family um and i'm gonna go home i changed on my terms I was who I was, and I was ready just to live or die for my decision. I was exhausted, man. I was exhausted. I had been through so much. I had seen so much, and I had done so much. I was dealing with a, a great amount of remorse for what I did. I was in there for a horrible crime. A man lost his life. 
A mother had to close the casket on her son. That was a hard thing for me to deal with. That was the last thing that I was able to come to terms with and what drives me to this very day. So there was just so much going on in my life at the time. God damn, dude. So your lawyer, that was powerful. So your lawyer yeah. told you to postpone it and you did not postpone it? There was no way. I, I mean, my family, I, I, I had created a, I had created like a 75-page parole portfolio. Like I literally examined my entire life. I diagnosed myself. I wrote a treatment plan. I wrote a relapse oh. prevention plan. I wrote oh. plans in, uh, in case I'm walking in the mall, I'm covered in tattoos. What do I do if I get hit up by a gang member? How do you respond? You know, Dude, I, I had every scenario. That's fucking gold right there, man. And I mean, I could tell, I could straight up tell you're being authentic. I, I'm good at reading people, man. And I, the fact that you told your lawyer, like, nah, I'm cool. And you followed your heart. Because in essence, that's what you did. You followed your heart. You're like, I'm going to be fucking straightforward, man. Probably for the first yeah. time. I, I mean, I don't want to. I mean, first time. Like, that was probably for the first time in your life. Like, I'm going to be straight fucking forward, man. <laughs> first time. Hey, did it feel like a lot of weight lifted off your shoulders? Yeah, and it was funny because the, uh, the big question was, as a validated gang mm. associate sitting in front of the pro board, he says, what do you think I'm more worried about? You relapsing to drugs or gangs? And, and, and I, I said, drugs? He says, absolutely not. If you relapse into drugs, you're going to hurt yourself. You're probably checking to rehab, get your shit together. If you relapse into gangs, now you're going to be organizing my streets. You're going to be organizing blocks. You're going to use all this that you've been conditioned and learned over the years. And, and, and that's my biggest fear. You know, and, and, and I had got over the gang aspect. The drugs was the, was the hardest part for me. Wow, man. My mom used to tell me every single visit at the end of every single, I'm talking hundreds of visits, two things, Brian, don't shave your head. And remember, play the game. Don't live it because she knew she couldn't tell me what to do. And she's like, this shit ain't real. Those are not your homies. They're not going to die for you. Despite what you guys say. And as always, you know, mom. Wow. So you get out. You get out, man. What's, uh, did you have to go to one of those, uh, MCRPs or whatever houses? Yeah. So I, I, I got out, uh, in Ironwood, the door opens at six o'clock. I said my goodbyes. I'm packed. Uh, my, my one 30 years in prison. I walked out with a bag in my hand and everything fit in a small grocery bag. My, everything in my life that I owned my pictures, just the small things, got in the car, jumped in there with mom, sister, and one of the dogs that I trained and, uh, we went to in and out. Hey, what'd you think, man? You smashed some uh, double doubles or what? I, yeah, I smashed a couple of them and the fries and yeah, 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 yeah. It was be it was it was beautiful. Did it feel real? Was it surreal? Did, what kind of emotions were you? Uh, uh, let me. I don't. There's a thing called survivor's guilt. Did you experience sure. survivor's guilt? Meaning you were happy yeah. you were out, but you were thinking about your homies and everything that you left behind. So before you know, I, I walked out. Before I hit the rotunda, I do. I did a last turnaround and I seen everybody flashing their lights and they're hitting the doors. And I remember just scanning and thinking, fuck, dude, like I'm leaving, I'm leaving these guys behind. Some of them just as deserving as me. And yeah, I mean, I, I'd look up at, at some of my boys that were LWAPs, life without parole and hell yeah, it, it, it was difficult. You know, that's why I'm out here today. I like, I, I feel that weight. I feel that responsibility for sure. And my fear was always this right before I got released, I'd been found suitable. I'm waiting for, Gavin Newsom to sign off on it because if you have a murder, he has to sign off on it. And there was some kind of, uh, um, it was a murder or a shooting against the cop in Elmani. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. damn, they're going to shut this damn window on us mm -hmm. and it's going to close. That's a huge fear right there. That was a huge fear for me. I heard you mention on another podcast, man. I actually watched one of your clips on another podcast. You did mention that that like hey i feel like i have a burden like i cannot fuck up out here because i don't want that window to close on the people that are still in there and i don't want to fuck Imagine. up their shot yeah and i and you know i worked hard to get out here and it's hard man like it's a trip like you know i, I i've been conditioned one way my whole life to think and, and to interact one way and i've been that probably 75 percent of my life if not 80 and i've only been brian for about 20 percent. i've only been calling myself brian for about five years now when I got to Ironwood is when I actually began <laughs> identifying as Brian rather than my nickname. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that was another thing. It felt so good when, when, when you hear your name. That sort of began a trend in there too, to call people by their name. It just, I don't know, it provoked something because if somebody calls me by my nickname, I remember my friend would say, if I call you by your nickname, you turn around and the look you get 
The look you give is different from when if I call you Brian, because I'm requesting a complete different human being. Wow. Damn. You know? Yep. So, um, you know, just, just things like that, that, you know, I try to be conscious of and. Yeah. I get it. I get it, man. So. Where can people find you these days on social media? Uh, you, you mentioned you're helping people like is there anything you want to say right now to everybody? Yeah. So, I mean, my goal right now is, you know, I, I like speaking about these issues and these topics and the change because I mean, I, I was at a point to where like I'm a, a kid on meth. I've been convicted of murder. I came into prison, got hooked on heroin, you know, became a, an active gang member, was taught in there, went through all the schools, went through all the shoes and the holes. I've been shot by block guns, uh, you know, riots and just all the things that you go through. And then you come into a change and then you look at, at, at this world from another perspective. And it's a trip because you start, like I said, I met my friend after 20 years, you finally meet him. And now finally, I don't have this hang up. Now I'm able to engage with COs and, and, and you really get a, 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 a full look at, prison and, and, and what you can learn and grow from and how it can affect you and impact you. And I'm telling you, um, Lieutenant, I agree with you on so many things that you say, especially like the state of prison today. It's hard because I think of so many things and, and you know, watching your California insider provoked me to think of like different ways, like how can you fix things? It's tough, man. How do you, how do you package chaos, man? It's like, well, there, yeah. there, there's no way. And you want to do it to save lives on all sides. And like the goal, is for people to go home and for officers to come in and clock in and clock out and go home to their families. You know, Next. that's the end goal. And I think we all want that. It's just, how the fuck are we going to get there, man? Yeah. It's political, it's political power, you know, an agenda. Yeah. Now that I think of it. Um, and we're pawns. Like you said it before, right. we're all pawns. What's yeah. up? Did you want to say where people can find you or, or they want to reach out? Yeah. To you? So, I mean, my, my primary um, social media is free bliss. It's F R E E B L I S S with a one at the end. Um, I get a lot. My, my social media experience is being out has been all positive. It's Hell been yeah. all positive. Yeah. I, I haven't had anything negative. Um, yeah. Maybe a few things I've been uh, cloned a couple of times when I put the prison pictures up, they clone me. I don't know why I think that's an easy get, but it comes with the territory, but yeah. Um, you know, you, you can hit me up anytime. I'm open to talk and cool. Look, man, know, I I appreciate you. Thank you for coming on here. I didn't know you. I didn't know you before, man. But like standing in front of me, dude, is a definitely a grown man, dude. Somebody that I can tell that's been through the fucking trenches and has grown past that, dude. It's going to be guys like you with similar stories and experiences that are going to help the other individuals, man. Without a doubt. That's the goal. Yeah, that's the goal. And I appreciate uh, having me on, Lieutenant. Uh, that California Insider, that was a good one. And it was a trip, man. I just saw it and, and when we connected right after that, man. I, For I appreciate sure, it. man. Cool. Well, uh, let me close out, dude. Go ahead and stay on there. Okay. Wow. Damn. There you guys have it. 2024, man. Trying to bring you the truth. The truth from all perspectives. Thanks, you guys, for joining in. Keep pushing forward.